You know, as I think about the last uh, couple of weeks and the things that I've communicated from the book, uh, admittedly, they've been very solemn and uh, more like warnings. So it's almost a breath of fresh air to really turn a corner like we will today because you couldn't put together a bigger contrast than temporary. And what we're talking about this morning, the land of Beulah, uh, I hope I can say something uh, that's even worthy of the description here. But I wanted to make an announcement. Uh, we're probably done with this class in about four weeks, and I got permission from a couple of your pastors to finish out with a study of the history of revivals in America at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. And why this era is interesting to me is the Connecticut Evangelical Magazine, which was started in the year 1800, was started specifically for the purpose to chronicle the revivals that were going on. And so a number of books that were written during that time period were written from that history. And it's an amazing history, and a lot of us don't know a lot about it. You have three of these pastors here that were also presidents of colleges. Uh, Heman Humphrey, uh, president of Amherst, Bennett Tyler, president of Dartmouth College, and Edward Dorr Griffin, president of William College. That was a happy time in this country because if you think about it, just look them up on Wikipedia and then click on the link that takes you to the college and see where they are today. I mean, with the way that uh, all of the students are brought in and there's no such thing as... Uh, you can't say anything against diversity and so on. It was a different time back then. And as I was, um, we were headed to church this morning, we turned a corner on 20th in Jenison, 20th Avenue, and immediately to the right of us is a huge Protestant Reformed church. And I always think about, you know, the draw there, because what's interesting about how they are taught if they are taught by the old school Protestant reform theologians, like David Inglesma and Herman Hankel here in town, what I want to communicate here in a historical sketch of revivals in America, they have no use for. But it's a history that we probably, many of us, have never really looked at the documents. And I can say that pretty safely because one of my most enjoyable times in June is when Dr. Kurt Daniels visits our church here. This year, for example, I was able to sit down with him because we had the fellowship dinner and pick his mind for about three hours on all historical events. He's so well learned. I mean, to me, he's there are three people that I love to pick their mind on that are so well read, and the other two I'll never probably have a chance to, Ian Murray and Richard Owen Roberts in Wheaton, Illinois. But even he admitted to me that he hasn't studied this historical sketch so much. In the beginning of the 1800s in the story of revival, so I think you will find it interesting. And the one thing to really listen for and weigh and ponder is, as you hear the accounts of what was going on during these revivals, was this a work of God or is this merely human enthusiasm and sympathy and it could all be explained by natural causes. At this time, we begin our study of Pilgrim's Progress, the story of Beulah Land. So in Pilgrim's Progress, it says, Now I saw in my dream that by this time the pilgrims had traveled over the enchanted ground and were entering into the country of Beulah. With the way lying directly through it, the air in that place was very sweet and pleasant, and so they rested and refreshed themselves there for a time. Here they heard the continual singing of birds and every day enjoyed various blooming flowers in the land. They also heard the voice of the turtle dove in this country where the sun shines night and day. Therefore it was beyond the valley of the shadow of death and out of the reach of giant despair. In fact, from this place they couldn't even see Doubting Castle. 
Here the pilgrims were within sight of the celestial city. Here too they met some of the inhabitants of that place, for in this land the shining ones frequently walked, because it was upon the borders of heaven. In this land also the contract between the bride and the bridegroom was renewed. Yes, here is a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so does God rejoice over them. So the common consent of commentators is this is not yet entering into death. They're not at the river of death. But they do get something of a foretaste of the glory that is coming. Something of the joys, the pleasures of the place they're going And they're far enough now in their pilgrimage to know that they're way out of the reach of the castle of giant despair and the giant that lived there in the valley of the shadow of death. And it's an interesting subject to meditate on, and I'll try to demonstrate later that though it was as late as the late 19th century, uh, this stuff isn't chronicled much anymore in pastoral sketches of people that they talk to that are in this state. But let's start with Richard Baxter. One of the earliest books that he wrote, probably at the age of uh, 35, the reason he wrote it is because Baxter, at the time, was so sick that he felt he already had one foot in the grave and was writing on spiritual meditations, firstly for himself, It's interesting, the books that are online, this is 1651 of second edition, if you think about it, you know anything about Baxter, that's 40 years before he died. He died in the year 1691, but Baxter says, When we have had in this world a long night of darkness, will not the day breaking and the rising of the sun of righteousness be then seasonable? When we have passed a long and tedious journey, through no small dangers, is not home then seasonable? When we have had a long and perilous war and received many a wound, would not a peace with victory be seasonable? Men live in a continual weariness, especially the saints who are most weary of that which the world cannot feel. Some weary of a blind mind, some of a hard heart, some of their daily doubts and fears, some of the lack of spiritual joys, and some of the sense of God's wrath. And when a poor Christian has desired and prayed and waited for deliverance many years, is it not then seasonable? This rest will be absolutely perfect. We shall then have joy without sorrow and rest without weariness. There is no mixture of corruption with our graces, nor of suffering with our comfort. There are none of those waves in that harbor which now so toss us up and down. Today, we are well. Tomorrow, we are well sick. Today in esteem, tomorrow in disgrace. Today we have friends, tomorrow none. Nay, we have wine and vinegar in the same cup. If revelations raise us to the third heaven, the messenger of Satan must presently buffet us, and the thorn in the flesh fetch us down. But there is none of this inconstancy in heaven. If perfect love casts out fear, then perfect joy must cast out sorrow. And perfect happiness exclude all the relics of misery. We shall there rest from all the evil of sin and suffering. Pilgrim's Progress narrative, now as they walked in this land, they experienced more rejoicing than in other parts that were more remote from the kingdom to which they were headed. But now drawing nearer to the city, they had a more perfect view of it. It was built of pearls and precious stones, and the streets were paved with gold. As a result, the natural glory of the city and the reflection of the sunbeams upon it made Christian homesick with longing for it. Hopeful also had a fit or two of the same sickness. Therefore, the two of them stood for a while in front of the vista and continued to cry out because of their pangs. If you see my beloved, tell him that I am sick of love. But being a little strengthened and better able to endure their sickness, they walked along their way in came nearer and nearer to the celestial city. On either side were orchards, vineyards, and gardens, and their gates opened into the highway. James Rogers, 1879, said in his commentary, In this country it is said the sun shines night and day. In a former part of their lives they occasionally obtained a glimpse of the sun of righteousness, but he was soon hidden from their sight by thick clouds. 
And the night came on when they walked in darkness and had no light. But now they see him continually. His light lights their souls. There is not a speck of a cloud between him and them. He withdraws not himself from them by day or night. No wonder then that this delightful country is said to be beyond a valley of the shadow of death and also out of reach of giant despair. For when Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shines upon the soul, its darkness is gone. Doubting and despair are at an end. Now it is certain from the Word of God that His people, even in the mid-time of their days, have attained such a happy state as this, a state in which they could no more doubt the excellency and the glory of Christ than they could doubt the sun when shining in His meridian strength. Archibald Alexander wrote, No arguments have ever so powerfully operated on my mind to convince me of the reality and power of experimental religion as witnessing the last exercises of some of God's children. Some of these scenes, though long past, have left an indelible impression on my memory. This is written in 1844 and I hope a salutary impression on my heart. So he visits one of the dying women that is under his care. Though when in health she was never reckoned beautiful, yet there was now in her countenance animated with hope and love and religious joy, or rather peace, a beauty of countenance which I never saw equaled. Well, the background of this story is this this lady lived in a house who and had a husband, an infidel, who was really, could never say a kind word to her. And the house was in disarray in some ways, and yet she kept it up in so many others. But he says of her, it was what may without impropriety, impropriety be called spiritual beauty. This is what he's witnessing in her countenance. The mind of this young lady possessed a uniform serenity undisturbed with fears, doubts, or cares. Everything seemed right to her submissive temper. It was enough that her Heavenly Father appointed it to be so. For many weeks she lay in the state of perfect tranquility, as it were, in the suburbs of heaven. And I believe no one ever heard a complaint from her lips. Even that grief which had preyed on her health when able to go about had now ceased to cause her pain. Hers was, in my apprehension, the nearest approximation to complete happiness which I ever saw upon earth. Yet there was no violence of feeling, no agitation, no rapture. It was that kind of happiness which from its gentleness and calmness is capable of continuance. As it was her request that I should visit her often, and I had mentioned before that Archibald Alexander was a pastor for 20 years before he became the first uh, seminary professor at Princeton. And I heard really good things about him as a pastor. And of course, good pastors visit their flocks, their sheep, their the laity. So she says, could you visit me often? I did so as frequently as the distance of my residence and other avocations would permit, not as often said with any expectation of communicating anything good to her, but of receiving spiritual benefit from her heavenly conversation. Oh, how often did I wish that the boldest infidels, and they were rampant at that time, could have been introduced into the chamber of this dying saint. There was no enthusiasm. Nothing approaching to what may be called a heated imagination. All was sober. All was serene. All was gentle. All was rational. And although it was 45 years ago since I witnessed this scene, the impression on my mind is distinct and vivid. The indescribable countenance, calm but animated, pale with disease but lighted up with an unearthly smile, the sweet and affectionate tones of her voice, the patient, submissive, cheerful, and a grateful temper are all remembered with a vividness 
and permanence with which I remember nothing of recent occurrence. I had mentioned uh, a quote by Lay Richmond, English pastor, at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, in a tract he wrote called The Dairyman's Daughter, the story of Elizabeth Walbridge, daughter of Joseph Walbridge, born, lived, and died in the parish of Arrington, Isle of Wight in England. I mentioned the tract. I didn't give any details of the tract. This tract... Um, in its initial publication, four million copies were sent out in 20 languages or more. And by the end of its usefulness, when we didn't hear about it a lot anymore, it had probably been 10 million copies of this tract distributed about this lady's story. Her parents were worthy but lowly and poor and their children put out to domestic service at an early age. The author of the narrative was Reverend Lay Richmond, a religious writer of the period who was curate of the nearby Church of England, parish of Braiding. According to the account in the book, Miss Walbridge's life until the age of 26 was of a most worldly character. Although never immoral, she was willful, proud, selfish, and irreligious. However, her life was transformed by a sermon, and she became very devout. With exceptional strength of mind, a retentive memory, the mastery of a few religious classics, and enforced leisure because of illness, she devoted time and strength to the study of the Bible, in which she became remarkably knowledgeable. She died after a lingering sickness of a year and a half on the 30th of May, 1801, at the age of 31. During her illness, Lay Richmond often visited her and talked with her, and these discussions inspired him to write the book. Well, as I was looking at the account of this in Wikipedia, they said that this genre, pastors writing about saints in their dying days, used to draw quite uh, a lot of interest, and in our days, these things aren't read as much and you can come up with your own reasons why that may be the case but these things are always very edifying if you want to let go of your too eager grasp of this life and become familiar with death and the grave and heaven beyond so many because of this story visited the grave of the dairyman's daughter including queen victoria the simple chair on which Miss Walbridge sat when talking with Reverend Richmond was preserved and in 1836 sent to America, where it remains in the possession of the American Tract Society. A chapel was erected in her memory. Who can conceive or estimate the nature of that change which the soul of a believer must experience at the moment when, quitted its tabernacle of clay, it suddenly enters into the presence of God? If even while we see through a glass darkly, the views of divine love and wisdom are so delightful to the eye of faith, what must be the glorious vision of God when seen face to face? If it be so valued a privilege here on earth to enjoy the communion of saints, and to take sweet counsel together with our fellow travelers towards the heavenly kingdom, what shall we see and know when we finally come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God? the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, Hebrews twelve twenty two to 24. Reading from part of the tract, which is 52 pages, that's just a couple of, Paragraphs. From the time in which I visited her, as described in my last paper, I considered her end as fast approaching. One day I received a hasty summons to inform me that she was dying. It was brought by a soldier whose countenance bespoke seriousness, good sense, and piety. I am sent, sir, by the father and mother of Elizabeth Walbridge at her own particular request 
to say how much they all wish to see you. She is going home, sir, very fast indeed. Have you known her long? I inquired. About a month, sir. I love to visit the sick. And hearing of her case from a person who lives close by our camp, I went to see her. I bless God that ever I did go. Her conversation has been very profitable to me. I rejoice, I said, to see in you as I trust a brother soldier. Though we differ in our outward regimentals, I hope we serve under the same spiritual captain. I will go with you. My horse was soon made ready. My military companion walked by my side and gratified me with very sensible and pious conversation. He related some remarkable testimonies of the excellent disposition of the dairyman's daughter as they appeared from recent intercourse which we had, he had had with her. She is a bright diamond, sir, said the soldier, and will soon shine brighter than any diamond upon earth. We passed through lanes and fields, over hills and through valleys by open and retired paths, sometimes crossing over and sometimes following the windings of a little brook which gently murmured by the roadside. Conversation beguiled the distance and shortened the apparent time of our journey till we were nearly arrived at the dairyman's cottage. As we approached it, we became silent. Thoughts of death, eternity, and salvation inspired by the sight of a house where a dying believer lay filled my own mind, and I doubt not that of my companion also. No living object yet appeared except the dairyman's dog, keeping a kind of mute watch at the door, for he did not as formally bark at my approach. He seemed to partake so far of the feelings appropriate to the circumstances of the family as not to wish to give a hasty or painful alarm. He came forward to the little wicket gate, then looked back at the house door as if conscience, conscious there was sorrow within. It was as if he wanted to say, tread softly over the threshold as you enter the house of mourning, for my master's heart is full of grief. The soldier took my horse and tied it up in a shed. A solemn serenity appeared to surround the whole place. It was only interrupted by the breezes passing through the large elm trees which stood near the house, and which my imagination indulged itself in thinking were plaintive sighs of sorrow. I gently opened the door. No one appeared, and all was yet silent. The soldier followed. We came to the foot of the stairs. There are come, said a voice, which I knew to be the father's. They are come. He appeared at the top. I gave him my hand and said nothing. On entering the room above, I saw the aged mother and her son supporting the much-loved sister. The son's wife sat weeping in a window seat with a child on her lap. Two or three persons attended in the room to discharge any office which friendship or necessity might require. I sat down by the bedside. The mother could not weep, but now and then deeply as she alternately looked at Elizabeth and at me, the big tear rolled down the brother's cheek and testified in affectionate regard. The good old man stood at the foot of the bed, leaning upon the post and unable to take his eyes off the child from whom he was so soon to part. Elizabeth's eyes were closed, and as yet she did not perceive me. But over the face, though pale, sunk, and hollow, the peace of God which passes all understanding had cast a triumphant calm. The soldier, after a short pause, silently reached out his Bible towards me, pointing with his finger at 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 58. I then broke silence by reading the passage. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. At the sound of these words, her eyes opened, and something like a ray of divine light beamed on her countenance, and she said, Victory, victory, through our Lord Jesus Christ. She relapsed again, taking no further notice of anyone present. God be praised for the triumph of faith, I said. Amen, replied the soldier. The dairyman's uplifted eye showed that the amen was in his heart, though his tongue failed to utter it. A short struggling for breath took place in the dying young woman, which was soon over. 
And then I said to her, my dear friend, do you not feel that you are supported? The Lord deals very gently with me, she replied. Are not his promises now very precious to you? They are all, yea and amen, in Christ Jesus. Are you much in bodily pain? So little that I almost forget it. How good the Lord is and how unworthy am I. You're going to see him as he is. I think, I hope, I believe that I am. She again fell into a short slumber. Looking at her mother, I said, what a mercy to have a child so near heaven as yours is. And what a mercy, she replied in broken accents, if her poor old mother might follow her there. But sir, it is so hard to part. I hope through grace by faith you will soon meet to part no more. It will be but a little while. Sir, said the dairyman, that thought supports me and the Lord's goodness makes me feel more reconciled than I was. Father, mother, said the reviving daughter, he is good to me. Trust him, praise him evermore. Sir, she added in a faint voice, I want to thank you for your kindness to me. I want to ask you a favor. You buried my sister. Will you do the same for me? All shall be as you wish, if God permit, I replied. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have another favor to ask when I am gone. Remember my father and mother. They are old, but I hope the good work has begun in their souls. My prayers are heard. Pray. Come and see them. I cannot speak much, but I want to speak for their sakes. Sir, remember them. The aged parents now sighed and sobbed aloud, uttering broken sentences and gaining some relief by such an expression of their feelings. At length I said to Elizabeth, Do you experience any doubts or temptations on the subject of your eternal safety? No, sir. The Lord deals very gently with me and gives me peace. What are your views of the dark valley of death now that you are passing through it? It is not dark. Why so? My Lord is there, and he is my light and my salvation. Have you any fears of more bodily suffering? The Lord deals so gently with me, I can, I can trust him. Something of a convulsion came on. When it was past, she said again and again, the Lord deals very gently with me. Lord, I am yours, save me. Blessed Jesus, precious Savior, his blood cleanses from all sin. Who shall separate? His name is wonderful. Thanks be to God. He gives us a victory. I, even I, am saved. O oh, grace, mercy, and wonder. Lord, receive my spirit. Dear sir, dear father, mother, friends, I am going. But all is well, well, well. She relapsed again. We knelt down to pray. The Lord was in the midst of us and blessed us. She did not again revive while I remained, nor ever speak any more words which could be understood. She slumbered for about ten hours, and at last sweetly fell asleep in the arms of that Lord who had so dealt so gently with her. I left the house an hour after she had ceased to speak. I pressed her hand as I was taken leave and said, Christ is a resurrection and the life. She gently returned the pressure, but could neither open her eyes nor utter a reply. I never had witnessed a scene so impressive as this before. It completely filled my imagination as I returned home. Farewell, I thought, dear friend. Till the morning of an eternal day shall renew our personal intercourse. You are a brand plucked from the burning. That you might become a star shining in the firmament of glory. I have seen your light and your good works and will therefore glorify our Father which is in heaven. I have seen in your example what is to, it is to be a sinner freely saved by grace. I have learned from you as in a living mirror who it is that begins, continues, and ends the work of faith and love. Jesus is all in all. He will and shall be glorified. He won the crown and alone deserves to wear it. May no one attempt to rob him of his glory. He saves and saves to the uttermost. Farewell, dear sister in the Lord. Your flesh and your heart may fail, but God is the strength of your heart and shall be your portion forever. End quote. Pilgrim's Progress. Now I saw in my dream that they taught more in their sleep at this time than they had ever done in all their journey. 
As I pondered the reason for this, the gardener said to me, Why do you deeply ponder this matter? It is the nature of the fruit of the grapes of these vineyards to go down so sweetly as to cause the lips of them who are asleep to speak. So I saw that when they awoke, they prepared themselves to go up to the city. But as I said before, the reflection of the sun upon that city, which was of pure gold, was so extremely glorious that they could not face it directly to look at it as yet. Instead, they viewed it through an instrument made for that purpose. So I saw that as they went on their way, two shining ones met them. They were dressed in clothing that shone like gold, and their faces glowed radiantly as light. These men asked the pilgrims where they came from, and they told them. The shining ones also asked them where they had lodged, as well as what difficulties and dangers they had met with along the way, and what comforts and pleasures they had experienced. And so Christian and Hopeful told them that the two shining ones said to them, You have only two more difficulties to deal with, and then you will go and enter into the city. Christian and his companion asked the men to go along with them. The men told them they would, but said, You must obtain it by your own faith. Just one more story, a little shorter. The deathbed of Edward Payson, and I've mentioned this guy a number of times, and yet uh, I think in our day, we're probably more familiar with his daughter, Elizabeth Prentice, because uh, of the hymn that we sing in our hymnal, More Love to Thee, and uh, books she has written. But Edward Payson was such a godly man, they called him the praying Payson of Portland, Portland, Maine. And it says, A letter indicted to his sister about this time is highly descriptive of the glory that ravished his soul, so he's in a dying state. Were I to adopt, he said, the figurative language of Bunyan might date this letter from the land of Beulah, of which I have been for some weeks a happy inhabitant. The celestial city is full in view, its glories beam upon me. Its breezes fan me, its odors are wafted to me, its sounds strike upon my ears, and its spirit is breathed into my heart. Nothing separates me from it but the river of death, which now appears but is an insignificant rill that may be crossed at a single step whenever God shall give permission. The sun of righteousness has been gradually drawing nearer and nearer, appearing larger and brighter, as he approached, and now he fills the whole hemisphere, pouring forth a flood of glory in which I seem to float like an insect in the beams of the sun, exulting yet almost trembling, which while I gaze upon this excessive brightness, and wondering with unutterable wonder why God should deign thus to shine upon a sinful worm. At one time he was heard to break forth into the following soliloquy, what an assemblage of motives to holiness does the gospel present? I am a Christian. What then? Why, well, I am a redeemed sinner, a pardoned rebel, all through grace and by the most wonderful means which infinite wisdom could devise. I am a Christian. What then? Why, well, I am a temple of God, and surely I ought to be pure and holy. I am a Christian. What then? I am a child of God and ought to be filled with filial love, reverence, joy, and gratitude. I am a Christian, what then? Why, I am a disciple of Christ and must imitate him who is meek and lowly in heart and please not himself. I am an heir of heaven and hastening on to the abodes of the blessed to join the full choir of glorified ones and sing in the song of Moses and the Lamb and surely I ought to learn that song on earth. I'll finish the story in a second, but... Um, I had quoted from this book last week. I'm not going to quote it. I'm going to introduce it to you. This is my second copy. This just came in the mail, so I hadn't really looked at it until this morning. And uh, the author, Davis Clark, put this together when the plague had come into New York and he was laid aside from his regular pastoral duties because you couldn't really go from house to house lest you contract some of the diseases which gave him the leisure to put this volume together and I have narrated from three different authors on the subject of 
deathbed scenes, this is the one that's the fullest. But of uh, 560 pages, 560 such pages, only 130 are like the ones that I read from last week, the deathbed of the wicked, the atheist, the infidel, and so on. 400 and some pages of this is the deathbed of the saints. And, of course, books like this aren't reprinted anymore. There doesn't seem to be the same interest in it, but he goes through the martyrs, what we have recorded of Christians who are on the verge of going into heaven through Christian ministers, Christian women, and so on. And I never get tired of reading this stuff because there's a reason that Solomon said the house of mourning is more instructive than the house of feasting. So Mrs. Payson, while ministering to her husband, observed, Your head feels hot and seems to be distended, to which he replied, It seems as if the soul disdained such a narrow prison and was determined to break through with an angel's energy. And I trust with no small portion of an angel's feeling until it mounts on high. Soon after, it seems as if my soul had found a pair of new wings and was so eager to try them that in her fluttering she would rend the fine network of the body to pieces. Hitherto I have viewed God as a fixed star, bright indeed, but often intercepted by clouds, but now he is coming nearer and nearer and spreads into a sun, so vast and glorious that the sight is too dazzling for flesh and blood to sustain. Conversing with a friend on his preparation for his departure, he compared himself to a person who had visiting his friends, been long absent from home and was about to return. His trunk was packed and everything prepared, and he was looking out the window waiting for the stage coach to take him in. On the 21st of October, 1827, his dying agony commenced. A difficulty of respiration causing excruciating distress and accompanied by a rattling in the throat such as often precedes dissolution gave warning of death's approach. When his daughter, who had been called home from the Sabbath school, entered, he smiled upon her, kissed her affectionately and said, God bless you, my daughter. Doesn't say if this is his daughter Elizabeth or another daughter. Soon after, he exclaimed, peace, peace, victory, victory. Turning a glance of inexpressible tenderness upon his wife and children, he said to them, almost in the words of dying Joseph to his brethren, I am going, but God will surely be with you. The power of utterance had now nearly failed him. His friends watched him, expecting every moment to see him expire. Till near noon, when his distress partially left him, and he said to the physician who was feeling his pulse that he found he was not to be released yet. And though he had suffered the pangs of death and had got almost within the gates of paradise, yet if it was God's will that he should come back and suffer still more, he was resigned. He passed through a similar scene in the afternoon, and to the surprise of everyone was again relieved. On Monday morning, his dying agonies returned in all their extremity. For three hours, every breath was a groan. Mrs. Payson, fearing from the expression of suffering in his countenance that he was in mental as well as bodily anguish, questioned him upon the subject. With extreme difficulty, he was unable to articulate the words, faith and patience hold out. About midday, the pain of respiration abated and a partial stupor succeeded. Still, however, he continued intelligent and evidently able to recognize all present in his eyes and countenance spoke after his tongue. It had now become motionless. He looked on Mrs. Payson and then his eye, glancing over the others who surrounded his bed, rested on Edward, his eldest son, with an expression which said, and which was interpreted by all present to say as plainly as if he had uttered the words addressed to the beloved disciple, Behold your mother. There was no visible indication of the return of his sufferings. He gradually sunk away till about the going down of the sun when his happy spirit was set at liberty. So I want to close with uh, my friendship with Johnny Farisi. And not everybody here knows uh, Johnny. Um, Johnny was a quadriplegic. I 
found it interesting that it wasn't until Friday that I even wanted to tell my relation to him and this part of the story. And then realized as I was looking at the date uh, that it was the fourth anniversary of his passing into glory. But back in 1997, very few people were doing websites. And Betty and I were newlyweds. Uh, Jonathan wasn't even born yet. And I'm putting together this website, and I'm friends with Johnny Farisi, and this guy is sending out all of our emails from church to church, uh, you know, for prayer, and sending out devotional thoughts and so on. But it was simply remarkable that he did his webpage design with a pipe connected to a machine and voice recognition software, and a box that could turn the lights on in the room and turn on his computer and so on. Early web design was done in a code called HTML, which he had mastered, and was actually making a living doing web design as a quadriplegic that couldn't even move his arms and so on. So in my early days of designing a web page, he was actually assisting me. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to add music to what I was doing, but, um, you know, he, su he suffered for a lot of years, yet never complained about it. And it was remarkable how even more of what he enjoyed was taken away, that he got to where he could only survive by taking his food through a feeding tube. And his lungs had gotten to the point where they had to devise a method to clear out his saliva from his mouth every once in a while because he couldn't swallow. And you would get these updates from this dear brother who said for the first time in six months he was able to have the sunshine of southern Florida hit his face as he was going to the medical facility to have his feeding tube replaced. And... Um, I never got to meet him in person, but I, I wrote to him uh, shortly before he passed away, and I said, you know, a lot of people, they go to southern Florida for Disney World and a number of other things, but I said, Johnny, my, my biggest wish, which I don't think is I'm going to be able to realize, is to be able to sit by your bedside and fellowship with you. And, uh, of course, he was thankful for that, but he was such a an example to some of us and I don't I don't heed that example like I should because here is a guy who was so limited who complains so little who did so much in the service of the Lord without even being able to move his body only his lips and so when he passed away four years ago this week I rejoiced for him because his body was so wrecked with this muscular atrophy which affected him when he was but a teenager and he was shutting down for the last years of his life. The doctor never even believed that he would live as long as he would live. And I guess the exhortation to you and people that hear this recording is, you know, what are our priorities? A lot of people would have no use to sit beside a bedside like that. By the way, that's uh, Bill Hughes in the picture, pa Pastor William Hughes, who was his pastor down in uh, southern Florida with Jeff Johnson. And he had some good friends. He was a Red Sox fan. He loved Steve Green. Steve Green would visit with him and so on. But he was simply, to me, he was simply a remarkable human being for giving everything he had with all of his might, yet he had so little physical ability. But I rejoice as I bring this Sunday school to a close to think about this battered body now receiving in the future a glorified body and he will suffer no more. And it makes me long for the day that we can leave. There's so much trial in this life. There's so many things that bring us down. And there's coming a day when 
we don't have to deal with this anymore and we could have that perfect body given to us Father who is sufficient for these things why are we so little thankful for what you have done we have these examples but I pray sometimes we don't think of these things as we should because we hardly believe that they're true for us and yet we glorify you if we embrace them and look forward to them and we pray you would strengthen our faith and strengthen our inward inclinations so that we have a desire to press on towards this and not towards the things of this world which are continually fighting for their ascendancy in our affections. We commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.